Uh, let's just get this out of the way. I'm not from around here. I don't talk like you talk. You don't talk like I'll talk. So we'll just be ourselves, okay? So here it is. How y'all doing this morning? Everybody good? Uh, we're so glad to be here. And we've been excited about this work up here ever since... Uh, Jeremy and Chelsea decided that God was calling them to move up into this area. We've been praying for you all, and we've been thinking about this. We've, been, uh, we've worshiped with you a couple of times before, uh, my wife Sammy more than I have, because she's been up here more often. And uh, we, we think about what God is doing up here. We get excited whenever we hear uh, reports and get texts and phone calls about the different things that God is doing. And so we're just partnering with you and uh, joining with you in all of this. And so it's our pleasure to be up here and uh, uh, to help and to get to know uh, this church and this area a little bit more. And also to think about, okay, how can we better help in the future? We have a lot of people in our church that want to come up here. In fact, we had an interest meeting uh, about it. And we had uh, 26 or 27 people that said, I would like to come up in the uh, Albany area and work and do that. And, and uh, we kind of, uh, uh, scheduling and all of that kind of pared us down to the group we have now, which is probably good because that gives us a chance to, you know, just kind of feel things out, get to know what's happening and uh, plan on maybe bringing more people uh, next year to do uh, bigger and better things, and we'll do that, of course, for the glory of God. Uh, I'll introduce the people that are with you. This is uh, Joel Jackson. Would you uh, stand or do something like that? Uh, Joel has been an evangelist, uh, traveling and preaching and singing. He's also been a pastor, and uh, he's got a ton of experience. I've known him for 30-some years now since uh, he, was, he was a kid and I was kind of in my student group uh, way back back in the day and so we're glad to have him with us and uh, he, he's got a lot of experience and uh, a good head on his shoulders for things he'll help us a lot with this and this is his daughter Emily okay and Emily's the by far the youngest on our team and uh, she's a music major now and still in college and we're excited for her to be here and this is Dale and Susan Marshall and uh, I've had the privilege of working with them now at Graceway for, I've been there uh, uh, just about 21 years, and uh, they predate me at the church, and uh, more like a brother and sister than uh, anything else. And this is my wife, Sammy. Uh, maybe you uh, recognize her from being here before. She's the one with the purple in her hair, and uh, Maverick likes that somewhat. So uh, anyway, we are excited about being here and uh, looking forward to what God does um, in and through you. Because it really is, when you come down to it, it's really about God. It's not about us. It's not about what we plan to do. It's not like we're uh, putting together a, you know, a, a Cadillac and pulling up to the gas pump and saying, Look, God, here's what we've done, and we've got great plans. Now fill it up with power. Uh, it's not about that. It's about us yielding and surrendering ourselves to the Lord and saying, Lord, what do you want to do through us? And of course, anything that he chooses to do is fine. Let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm uh, uh, 57 years old. That's hard for me to believe because I don't feel that old. Well, sometimes I do. And um, I've been in the ministry since I was 20. And I've served at different churches in different states. But before that, my dad was in the military. And so we lived all over the place. I've lived on both coasts. I've lived in the north. I've lived in the south. I've lived in Germany. And uh, so uh, I don't really have a hometown. I've been a lot of different places, met a lot of different people, seen a lot of different things. And I think God uses that to uh, uh, different parts of the ministry, different people that I meet, different places that I go. It, it makes it kind of interesting sometimes. And um, I've been at the church that I'm presently serving now for uh, 21 years. And um, as I think about how I look at life and how I look at things, I'm going to take you to a passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 2. So if you have a Bible, you uh, go ahead and turn there to Acts chapter 2. And we'll begin reading at verse 42. Um, if you're using a phone or something like that, then I'll give you a little bit of time to find it. But uh, 
I started thinking as I read about these passages, every church I've ever been to, every church that I've been, whether it was in California, whether it was in Kansas, whether it was in Oklahoma or Georgia or Texas, whether it was in Arkansas or whether it was in Virginia, whether it was in Berlin, Germany, everywhere that I've been, and on different mission trips, whether it's been in Honduras or Venezuela or whether it's been in India or different places like that, every church kind of has the same idea of what they want. And we frame them in various mission statements and philosophical statements and all of that. And I, I find in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, man, this is the kind of church I want and I know this is what you want as well. And yet it seems so difficult to get to that point. Churches have struggles. We're sinners that come together. We've made a mess out of our lives many times. And sometimes we do things that we know we ought not to do. Sometimes we do things we didn't know were wrong. And uh, we didn't intend for problems to arise and conflicts. We all have those kind of things. That's why we need the grace of God. And so I'll start off by saying this, what we just sang about when Jeremy was leading us, and by the way, uh, thank you so much for loving our kids and receiving them, and uh, we're, we're proud of them and, and their ministry here. And I do want to thank, uh, uh, thank Pastor Sean for allowing uh, us to come here and also for taking such good care of our family. We love you all for that and uh, appreciate it so much. But as I, I, I think about this, in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we kind of have the pattern and we find where God wants us to be. And um, on the screen, on the first slide that I have, I've got three pictures up there because every church wants to be a church that has hope. Every church wants to uh, impart hope to people and have people to be hope-filled. And the only hope we have is through the cross of Jesus Christ. As sinners, we come to him and we repent of our sin and we believe the gospel and he gives us new life. In fact, he doesn't just extend our lives. Sometimes I think we have the idea that it's me and I'm whom I, who I am and I'm going to live forever. Actually, what he does is he gives us a brand new life. It's eternal life with no beginning or no ending. You might say, wait a minute, Greg, how can something have no beginning or no ending? That sounds like God. And that's right. It's not that we become God. It's simply this. God gives us his life, eternal life, and he lives through us. And that's the hope that we have. Not self-improvement, not a humanistic idea that we can be better people and all of that, but we can die to self. We can surrender ourselves to Jesus Christ. And because of his death, burial, and resurrection, when we repent of our sins and put our trust fully totally in Jesus Christ, he comes to live within us to give us a brand new life. And that's where our hope is. Our hope is not in our income. Our hope is not in our marriage. Our hope is not in our friends. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. So anywhere we are and at any time under any circumstance, we can have hope. There's another picture that I have up there that is a sunrise. And every church wants to think about new beginnings. The Bible says his mercies are new every morning. That's the message that we have, that even for those of us who are saved, there is a freshness about the Lord and about his grace and about his cross, about his power, about his forgiveness and about his life that comes up every day. And we want to give that message to other people. There also will be a picture up there of uh, apples. We came up here one year and we went to uh, pick apples. Man, that was so much fun. And uh, that's the fruit that we want to have. We want our lives to show the evidence of the Lord and of his spirit and of his power. That's what everyone wants. In fact, reading the verses, it uh, says this, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Some translations say doctrine. That's what doctrine means, teaching. And the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers and awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And it sounds great, doesn't it? And all who believed were together and had all things in common, and they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, 
attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food uh, with glad and generous hearts, praising God and finding favor with all the people. That's their outreach. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. I want to ask you a question. Those of you who are uh, members of the fellowship here, isn't that what you want? And wouldn't you love to see that type of thing happening? To see people together, to see the joy, to see the number of people being saved and all of this kind of stuff going on. I mean, it's just, it's an awesome passage of scripture. And I thought about what every church wants. And the first thing that I noticed is that every church wants committed members. I mean, that's what we all want. Sometimes you have a, a time where you have a, some kind of a gathering and uh, nobody shows up. It's discouraging. You kind of want people to be committed. When you have a Bible study, you want people to come. You want them to be engaged. You want them to learn. You want them to grow. You want them to be able to teach others. We want people that are in church. We want people that are willing to serve, willing to help out. Everybody wants that type of thing. And that's where this church was, this early church. The New King James Version, I like the phrase, it says, they committed themselves steadfastly. Now, committed is one thing. Committed sometimes can be a legalistic type of thing. It's just what we're supposed to do. We're doing our duty. But when you're committed steadfastly, that means that your heart is in it. That means that you are doing it with zeal and you're doing it with joy and you're doing it not because you have to, but because you want to do it, you get to do it. And that's an exciting thing for a pastor, for your leadership team, for other people, for people just to be there and to want to actually be there. Everybody would want something like that. You notice, secondly in here, that not only were they committed, they devoted themselves to this, but then we start seeing these Christ-exalting miracles. There's this hunger in our soul as children of God to want to see the power of the Holy Spirit, to want to see Christ do wonderful, magnificent, powerful, awesome things that just capture our attention. They motivate us, they strengthen us, and sometimes we seek after those kind of things. Well, this church saw those kind of things, things that could not be explained by uh, common sense, Things that could not be explained by good planning. Things that could not be explained by talent or personality. Where you have to step back, whether you're lost or whether you're saved, to look back and say, that was the power of Christ. I don't know of any church I've ever been in anywhere at any time that did not want to see God move in powerful and miraculous ways. They had that. The next thing you notice here is it says that they started giving. Anytime they saw a need, those who were wealthier in the congregation, they would sell what they had and they would give it to meet the needs. I mean, there's a longing in our hearts to see church be a place where we don't just gather and then scatter, but a place where we really do love one another, where we care for one another, and where there are legitimate needs we actually do whatever is necessary to meet those needs, whether it's local or whether it's far off, whether it's a mission project or whether it's a person that's sitting in a chair next to you that's lost a job or having some kind of a hard time or medical bills or something. Church ought to be a place where we do that and we do it compassionately and we also do it generously, where it is something that just flows out of us. For we know the Bible says, Give and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together and running over, shall men give to you. And as we think about that, that's a faith prospect. We give and God gives to us. And God gives to us more so that we might be able to have more to give and invest in the lives of others. That's an awesome thing. Every church Every church would want something like that. I mean, I wish at our church, I wish we had a million dollars we could just invest here in River of Life. Wouldn't that be great? Think about all of the needs that that would meet. But we don't have that, so we give what we can give. And you don't have millions of dollars to give to others, but what do you do? You give what you can give and you give what you have. And the key is you give it generously 
and you give it compassionately and God begins to bless and it begins to overflow little by little, moment by moment, over time, God will pour that blessing into your life and you'll find that if you obey him, you will always have enough. And that's what we would love to have. Every church would love to have that type of thing. I noticed the fourth thing in here, they had a community of joy. Community is a big word. It's something that we want to relate to one another, to love one another, to be mentored by people who are more experienced than we are, to be able to mentor other people and to pour our lives into them. There's a joy in that. And you notice that the Bible says they were together. They were still going to the temple. And there's nothing wrong with going to the temple. Sometimes we look at the Old Testament and all we see is laws and rules and regulations. But if their heart was in what they were doing and they were doing it by faith, see these early believers would go to the temple and they didn't do it just out of a legalistic, ritualistic obligation. They would go and because of Christ, they would see things in the sacrifices they had never seen before. They would say, that's Jesus, that's about him. When they would see the blood that would flow over those altars, it would remind them of Jesus who died on the cross for them. There were all kinds of things that they would see. Someone said that the Old Testament is the New Testament uh, concealed, and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And so they would see that, and they would go together as believers, as Christians, as followers of Christ. They would go there, and they would see these things in the temple, and it was an amazing thing. But the thing that struck me out of this section of verses is the together passage. They went together to the temple. There was a community. There was a fellowship, we might call it, that they had. And then it says that they would go to each other's houses. For the New Testament believers, church was not just gathering in a certain building because they didn't have any buildings. Church was not just gathering at a place because they didn't have a place. You see, to them, church was people. It was believers indwelt by the Lord. And so they would gather, and they would gather in homes, and they would eat together, breaking bread, and they were glad. They had generosity again that would, that would come up. And they would just share life together, and they would get to know each other, to know each other's stories, to know each other's struggles, to know each other's successes and victories, to encourage one another, to pray with one another. There was a joyful community. It wasn't the kind of thing they got together and they were uh, down in the mouth or deadpan or, or bored with it. There was a joy that they had as they fellowshiped together. What church wouldn't love that, to have the people of God close and loving one another and fellowshipping with one another and, and uh, just... I, I don't know, you, you get the picture here, receiving all of this and, and uh, having it where it was just a powerful, powerful thing. And then there's another thing here, they had a consistent balance, kind of a vertical thing and a horizontal thing. They were pleasing the Lord, praising Him, and then they also had favor with all of the people. I find a lot of times people will become Christians, and as they begin to follow Christ, they isolate themselves from other people who don't know the Lord. They begin to look down their nose at other people. They begin to judge them and push them away or criticize and condemn them. As if our message to the world is this, you all need to shape up and change your behavior and be more like us. And that has never been the message of the church. That has never been the message of those who follow Christ. In fact, we can identify with them because we too are sinners, but we've been saved by the grace of God. And we have this good news. God is a loving, forgiving God. But we also have very bad news. All of us have sinned and we come short of the glory of God. And we have the worst news because we understand something that they don't. If you don't know Christ as your Savior and Lord and have not, have not trusted in His death, burial, and resurrection, then when you die you enter into judgment, and that judgment is an eternal judgment separated from God in a place called hell. That's a horrible thing to think about. So we've got good news. God's a loving, forgiving God. But the bad news is our sin, breaking God's law, brings us under the penalty of sin and condemnation. That's the worst news. But the best news that we have is this. 
For God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten, his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Can anybody say amen to that? Because for you, for me, for everyone, and so we spread this word out to other people. So we have a relationship where we are praising God and relating to him, but also finding favor with the people, where we're ministering to them, knowing them, loving them, serving them, and showing them a God that they can't see. Because you see, they think that they're good enough. They think that they are wonderful the way that they are. They're not out there just saying, oh, if somebody would only tell me this. Most of the people out there are looking at you when you tell them that story, saying, well, if it works for you, fine, but don't bother me and leave me alone. We find that a lot of people, when you start telling them about the grace of God, grace presupposes a reason for grace. If grace is unmerited favor, there must be a reason why I can't earn his favor. What is that reason? Because I've broken God's law. I'm separated from him. I'm dead in trespasses and sins apart from Christ. Well, people don't like to hear that. Maybe you don't like to hear that. But the most loving thing we can do is to tell you the truth. And that is the truth. That's our message. But we don't have to be mean. We don't have to be ugly as we do that. We don't have to be condemning as we do that. That's not our place. But we can be loving, and we can serve, and we can meet needs, and we can have a compassionate heart. It's interesting to me that they were praising God, so God is pleased with what they're doing, and they're finding favor with the people. They didn't shut people out of their lives. This was all a part of what they were doing. Now, what church would not like to have that kind of balance? Some churches are so completely man-centered, they're worthless. And some churches will center so much on God, they shut other people out of their lives. It's not supposed to be either or, it's both and. Praising God and favor with the people. God opens up the doors. The book of Proverbs says, when a man's ways please the Lord, even his in, he makes even his enemies to uh, love him. So think about that and think about all of these things. Everybody would want this. And then you get to this last part where this passage um, really gets our attention. And the Lord added daily, not weekly, not monthly, not yearly, but daily to the church, those who were being saved. And I look at that and I go, how awesome would it be to see people that would be coming to know the Lord and following him every single day? Can you imagine every week you gather, Pastor Sean has the baptistry tank out here and uh, there's someone, multiple people being baptized every single week to start seeing where every one of these chairs are filled with people that you don't know every single week. Where you find people every single week that are saying, wait a minute, I don't know how to find this book of the Bible. I don't have any idea who that Bible character is. And maybe that's you. And you know what? That's exciting. Because it's a wonderful thing to have people that are learning and growing. And as you start seeing that, the book of Acts, what they would do is at first they added to the church, the Lord did, and then you find later it says the number of disciples multiplied. Well, that's a whole lot better than adding. And then it says the number of disciples multiplied greatly. I read where uh, one scholar said that by the time you get into the book of Acts, before they were scattered, there may have been as many as 30 to 60 thousand people at this church in Jerusalem and it started off small God works through small things it started off very ordinary the apostles were just very ordinary men but it was God who was glorified it was God who was doing the work and God began to give his gospel and his grace through people reaching other people and they began to multiply who would not like to see that I know you would I know you would love that opportunity, but there's something in here that I left out. Because when I said committed, everybody would want that, but we tend to think of being committed to a program, 
committed to an organization, committed to a place. And that's not what the Bible says here. In fact, the Bible says that as we look at this type of thing, we, we have to pay close attention to those four things that I haven't even really talked about. Because sometimes what we do is we focus on seeing souls saved. And I love to see people get saved. I think we ought to be reaching out. I think we ought to be evangelistic. Please don't misunderstand me. But if you'll notice in this passage, that was not the main focus that they had. We would all love to be generous givers. And sometimes we say we need more money. We need people to give 10% of their income. We need consistent giving. We need you to be doing that. And we do. And it's a wonderful thing. But that's not what the focus is here. Sometimes we say, well, what we need to do is get to know each other and we'll be in each other's homes and home groups and life groups and, and uh, different things like that. Doing life together, we call it. But that's not really the focus of what we find in here. You see, all of these things that we want, all of these things that we long for, all of these things that every pastor wants, every church wants, every church member wants, this is what we long for. These things seem to be the result of something else. And what was it? The Bible says that they did something. They devoted themselves. They con continued steadfastly in, number one, the apostles' doctrine. I want to challenge you You've got a pastor who preaches the Word of God. Don't miss any opportunity to hear that. He's getting ready to start a new series that is going to be an exciting thing for your church. Don't miss it. But let me uh, encourage you to do something else. Don't leave it just up to him. Read your Bible every day. Study what it's teaching. And focus in on what the apostles taught from the book of Romans on. It's recorded for us in God's holy word. And these people did not just casually come and say, well, that's a nice thought. They weren't just casual readers of the word. They were doers of the word. They continued in the apostles' doctrine, the teachings of scripture, and they did it steadfastly. They took it as a personal responsibility they were going after it like a newborn baby goes after mother's milk with a voracious appetite, knowing that they needed it. I want to encourage you. Don't be the kind of person that's just casually attached, occasionally attached, every once in a while getting something because you're never going to grow and you're never going to be what God wants you to be. And these other things, the miracles, the giving, the reaching people for Christ, the community, the having favor with God and the people will never happen unless you are rooted and grounded in the Word of God. Notice that it also talks about them doing something else. It says that they were breaking bread together. I think that could be a reference to the Lord's Supper, but I don't think it is here because later on it talks about them meeting in other people's houses and breaking bread together as if they were eating together and having meals together. I want to encourage you. Don't just be the person that comes to church and says, well, nobody's ever invited me over to their home. Be the one who invites other people to your home. Be the one that with people in your neighborhood and people that you work with, do something. Invite them to eat a meal with you. Meet them for lunch. Meet them for coffee. Have them over into your home and let them get to know and to see what a Christian home and a Christian family is like because they may not know and they may think that you do strange things and weird things and uh, they're not real sure. Then they find out how normal you really are. And they find out what life is like for you. And they see your generosity and you get to know them and you hear their story and you get to share your story with them, which of course is going to be the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an amazing thing how we do that. In fact, in the book of Luke, for example, of studying through that, did you know as you watch Jesus in the gospel of Luke, he was either coming from a meal, eating a meal, or heading toward a meal. And he ate with Pharisees, and some of his greatest teachings came when he would eat with Pharisees. He also ate with people that the others called the riffraff, the tax collectors, the sinners, the prostitutes. And some of his great teaching came as a result of that. And I read that somebody said in our evangelistic strategy that if we would do more 
with food, we might have an opportunity to reach more people because everybody has to eat and everybody loves to eat. It seems to be the strategy in the New Testament. How did they fill the city with their doctrine? How did they grow so much? Because they knew what the apostles taught. They could explain it. And they ate together and fellowshiped together and included other people in it. And then it says that they would also continue in fellowship. They loved being together, whether it was in the temple, whether it was in someone's home, whether it was for a worship service. They would continually be together. They knew one another. And the Bible says that when we as the people of God love one another, it identifies us to the world. They see that we're his disciples. It bonds us together. It builds us up. It encourages us. Fellowship is so critically important. And the sad thing is now as churches, we're gathering together less and less because we're so busy. And isn't it interesting that even among Christian people, whenever we get in a time crunch, it's church that gets pushed out. It's not sports. It's not our pursuit of money or career. It's not any of our other leisure time. We push church away. The early church never did that. That's why they reached their city and they were so passionate about it. They continued steadfastly in the word of God and in their breaking of bread and sharing that together and in fellowship, the true commonality that they had is the Lord Jesus Christ. And then they did something else. They were people of prayer. One person said, if we ever got back as the people of God, as the church of God, to the book of Acts, we would become people of prayer. Mighty prayer. You find them praying, and uh, that's, uh, they were in a prayer meeting when the Holy Spirit came upon them. They were in a prayer meeting one time, and the place is shaken, and they were filled with boldness and spoke the word of God. These were the people that did these four things. And what happened? Did they want to see people saved? Absolutely. But it happened as a result of all of this, not by focusing in on that one thing. Again, I'm not saying to lessen your intensity to want people to be saved. Leave that where it is. But focus up here on those four things. And I want to leave you with this thought. As we do this, it becomes clearer and clearer that it's not really about us. I'm afraid sometimes, even as Christians and as churches, we become more humanist than we are Christ-centered. Because sometimes we start thinking about church, well, I need church because it makes me feel better. I need church because it centers my life. I need church because I build relationships and I have friends. And in that, while those things are not necessarily wrong, you'll notice that the focus is upon I need, I need, I need, and that's not the focus of the church. Sometimes we may look and we say, well, the people out here, this is what they need. This is what they need. They need to know the Lord. They need to have their marriage fixed. They need to have the power of God in their life. Nothing wrong with those things, except that it is still focused upon humans. In the book of Acts, the thing that we find they did is they focused upon Christ. And they focused upon the Lord and they focused upon His glory. They focused upon His name. They focused upon His gospel. And they made it about the Lord. And as they focused on Him, then the Lord opened the doors for things to spread out to reach the people. I'll close with a little story that I heard about some people that were uh, living in the 1700s. And they heard about an island. And on this island was a sugarcane plantation and it was filled with uh, African slaves. And the owner of the island was a British man who hated God and he hated anything about God. And he said, there will be no preacher, no missionary on our island. And he said, if they're shipwrecked, we're going to get rid of them. We'll put them back. There will be no churches, nothing like that at all. And these two men in their 20s, they uh, were a part of the Moravian movement. They were in Germany. And they heard about this. And they said, how can we get the gospel to those slaves on that island? And it became clear that the only way they were going to be able to do that is to become a slave. They sold themselves to that British landowner to be slaves in their 20s for the rest of their lives so that they could get the gospel there. 
Can you imagine what it was like to say goodbye to those two men? Their families are gathered there in Hamburg, Germany. And as the ship begins to leave, there are other people there, other believers there, and there's a lot of weeping, and they're very sad because they know they'll never see them again. Never see them again. And as the ship is pulling off, one of those young men with tears in his eyes, he took the hand of the other man and they raised it up and they shouted this and these are the last words they heard from these two. May the lamb that was slain receive the reward of which he is worthy. And that's the cry of the book of Acts. It's all about Jesus and what he is worthy of. And what is he worthy of? Our life, our thoughts, our time, our money, all of that put together. And what happens when we focus on those things? The apostles' doctrine, prayer, and fellowship, and breaking of bread. Out of that flows the miracle-working power of God, the generosity of giving, the community of joy that we want to have. All of that, even down to the conversion of souls, which glorifies and honors Jesus Christ more than anything that I could ever imagine. So I leave that with you. The Lord is worthy of the reward of his suffering, whatever the cost may be for you and for me personally. All that matters is that Christ is glorified. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Father, as we finish this up, we thank you so much for Jesus. And we apologize, Lord, that he becomes a sideline in our life. He becomes a hobby. He becomes maybe a philosophy. He becomes just a religious ideal. We're asking you today to break us so that you might live through us, so that Christ might be everything to us, and that our lives might be lived for his glory that the lamb that was slain might receive the reward that is worthy of his suffering. And I pray this asking your blessing on River of Life Church, on everybody that is here, and we do it in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much.